Welcome to the first online lecture for Computational Linguistics 1. I'm Jordan Boyd Graber at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. Today we're going to talk about the course, what it is, what's it about, how it's going to be run, and then we're going to dive into some of the preliminaries we need for the course, namely the technological foundations, Python, and the Natural Language Toolkit, and how to manipulate and use probabilities. So first off, what's computational linguistics? So if you take a look at how, what machine learning is doing, you could think that we've got this problem licked. We have cars that can drive a million miles without an accident and without a driver. Uh, we have algorithms and programs that can beat any living chess player. But compared with that, if you call up an automated call center, and compare that to the conversation that you would have with a five-year-old child, you'd almost certainly prefer the five-year-old child. So why is talking, conversing in natural language so much harder than these other uh, machine learning problems that really take years for a human to master? And in this course, we're going to learn about why natural language is so much harder than these other tasks. And that's what computational linguistics is. Computational linguistics is an attempt to get machines, computers, to understand, generate, and process natural language. And it, it's a very interdisciplinary subject. Uh, we need computer science to implement these algorithms. We need linguistics to give us the underlying theory and the data that we need in order to make these things work. Uh, we need statistics in order to get the information that we need from data. And we need experts in specific languages to help us understand uh, Navajo or Inuit or uh, Hindi. And we also need sociologists because language is so intricately connected to the social processes uh, that govern, govern human interaction. So some examples of the very specific things that we'll be doing in this course, we'll learn why the LY in ally and the LY in quickly are different. This is a problem called morphology. Uh, we'll create automatic solutions that can tell the difference in category or part of speech between the word water in water the flowers and drink the water. We'll also build up algorithms and theory that allow us to detect the difference between the sentence saw the sun with a telescope versus saw the astronomer with the telescope. And we'll also learn how to do things like translate a phrase in English into the language of your choice. Okay, so that's what computational linguistics is. Let's talk a little bit specifically about this course. So first, this is a flipped classroom. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to post lectures every week online. Uh, you're going to watch them and then come to class ready to ask questions. And in class we'll work through problems, uh, you'll work on homeworks, and I'll be there to help you. And so really your job starts at home watching the videos and getting uh, the stuff in your head so that you can come to class, ask the questions you need, and begin the conversation about the material. You will need some math background. We'll be asking you to manipulate equations. Uh, we'll expect you to be able to do basic calculus, derivatives, that sort of thing. You'll need to be able to work with uh, functions like exponentiation and logs. Uh, this course will extensively use probability and that is so important that we're going to be reviewing it this week and in class. It's hugely important, um, so if you feel that um, that might be a problem, you should invest some extra effort there. Come see me. This is very important. Uh, secondly, I, this is a computational linguistics class, so we're going to be using uh, programming languages and computers, so you'll need to be able to write Python programs, uh, interact with the Unix command line, uh, interact with data files, upload things to uh, a server where uh, so you can turn in your homework. We're going to be using a online uh, platform called Piazza. There's a link from the course webpage. So the lectures will be posted there. You can comment on them, ask questions. Make sure you keep track of the course webpage. 
the homeworks, the lectures, everything else will be posted there. You have five late days for your assignments in this course. You can distribute them however you want. Five late days on one assignment, one late day on five assignments. If you have medical or religious special needs, let me know about them on the first day of class uh, so that we can make sure that we address them. Look on the course webpage for the assigned readings. Most of them will be coming from this book, Speech and Language Processing by Daniel Jurasky and James Martin. Please read them before class. It will give you a lot of background, stuff that isn't covered in either the lectures or in class. Uh, it's very helpful, so please do the reading. And don't buy the first edition. Uh, there's about a decade in between the first and the second edition. It's not one of these pointless updates. Um, that publishers do. There is a lot of new content there, so please do buy the second edition. Again, we're using Piazza to manage all course communication. Don't use email. Ask your questions on Piazza. You can ask private questions. Uh, you can get help from other students. It's a very nice platform. And either I or one of the TAs will do our darndest to answer all questions within a day. Okay, so if you run into trouble, what should you do? So uh, explain what you're trying to do, give a minimal example, uh, so that if you're having a problem, say with your computer program, someone else should be able to replicate the problem easily. It shouldn't require any data or any information that only you have. So start from first principles and uh, make sure that we have everything we need to replicate any problems that you're having. Explain what you think should happen and explain what happens instead. And if at all possible, give us a copy paste of the output or a screenshot so that we can get a sense of what's going on. And also explain what else you've tried so we can sort of understand where in the process you are so that we can determine whether it's a technical problem, whether it's, a, whether it's some sort of conceptual problem, or if it's something else. But this sort of gives us an idea and, and helps us to be able to answer your questions more effectively. So keep this in mind. Uh, especially when you run into technical problems throughout the course. So a little bit about me. Uh, we'll have more introductions on the first day of class, but I'm a uh, fourth year assistant professor. I have appointments in the iSchool and the Institute for Advanced Computer Studies. I have two offices, one in Hornbake and one uh, in A.V. Williams. So uh, please do, uh, if we're arranging a meeting outside of normal office hours, uh, make sure uh, we're clear about where we're meeting. Um, this is the first time I've taught the class, although I, I taught the second course in the sequence before Computational Linguistics too. Uh, I was born in Colorado, and, and that's where most of my family live. I grew up in Iowa, a tiny town called Keokuk, and I went to high school in Arkansas, did my undergrad in California, uh, did grad school in New Jersey, uh, had some brief jobs in between, uh, worked on electronic dictionaries in Berlin, and uh, worked on Google Books in New York. One point of confusion is my name. My Terp Connect or uh, UMD ID is Ying, Y-I-N-G. That's uh, my wife's last name, uh, and I use that for my personal life. Uh, my Umiax ID is JBG. Uh, I think everybody should just call me Jordan. That's the simplest solution. Uh, please don't use Boyd Graver. Um, it's a little too formal for my taste, and people have problems pronouncing it correctly. Um, why my parents, uh, who had the nicknames Tony the Body and the Little Grabber, chose to hyphenate uh, is beyond me. My nickname in high school uh, I leave as an exercise to you. But anyway, call me Jordan. Everybody's happy. Okay, so next up... Um, some of the technical foundations that we're going to be using in the class. We're going to be using a programming language called Python. It's easy to learn, it's widespread, and it can be fast and efficient if you need it. We're also going to be using a uh, open source platform called the Natural Language Toolkit that you can use through Python. It has implementations of standard algorithms and it's, it makes it really easy to try new things out and process text. And so, uh, let's do a little bit of a demo of that. So we're going to begin by going through some of the foundations that we'll use for the course in terms of programming languages. 
and other utilities. So first, most of the interactions that we're going to have with the computer are going to be mediated through the command line. And so I called up a command line here, and there are several standard commands that uh, we'll be using. So one is a change directory command. So just like every uh, Unix command, it's processed by the name of the program, which in this case is cd, and then you give it an argument. So this says, change the directory to my home directory. So now we're in my home directory, and I now want to go to a directory called repositories, which is just where I keep the various repositories that I have. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check out the repository where the files that we'll be using for the course live. And so the name of that command that I'm going to use is called git, and I'm going to tell it to uh, clone a directory. And you can find the URL of the directory on the course web page. And now it's copied a new directory to my hard drive and we'll change into that directory. And it may look slightly different uh, than what we have here. Uh, hopefully your version will have a little bit more. Um, but the directory that we'll be interested in is this demo directory. So notice that I did the uh, list command to list all the files that are in this directory. Here are the files that are there at the moment. Yours may be slightly different, but this demo directory is the one that we're interested in, so I'm going to move into that. Okay, now we're there. Okay, so now let's start up Python. So there are two ways you can interact with Python. One is you can give it an argument and a name of some uh, source file. And so in this case, we have a file called shop.py, Python files end with the extension py, and we can run Python on that file, and then it does whatever is inside that file. We'll take a look at that file in a second, but what we're going to do instead is we're going to run it interactively. And so if you don't give Python any arguments, it will start up in what's called interactive mode where you can just type commands directly into Python and it will execute them. So let's try out some commands. So first, there are some basic operators in Python. So you can add two numbers together. You can multiply two numbers. And you can also exponentiate. So 2 to the third is 8. So 2 to the third. Let's just double check that the math is right. Yeah, seems right. OK, um, so in addition to uh, mathematical operators, there are also logical operators. And so we can test for equality. So is 1 equal to 0? No, it is not. Um, we can also negate. So is, uh, so if we negate, uh, not true, we get false, and not false is true. Um, we can also do or, so true or 1 equals 0 is true, but if we change the logical operator to and, we get a different result. So these are some of the basic operators that we have in Python. Next we'll talk about uh, some of the data types in Python. So now let's talk about how we interact with particular pieces of data in Python. So first, let's talk about assigning values to variables. So if we say that a is equal to 2, now Python will remember that a is 2. Uh, and if we type in b, We'll get this error saying b is not defined, but if we say that b is 3, now Python knows what it is. And so if we do a times b, we get 6. So Python knew to substitute uh, 2 for a and 3 for b. 
Now, every variable in Python has a type, and we can ask what the type of A is by going like so. And so this tells us that it's an integer. So both A and B are integers. Uh, had we defined it differently, we would get a different type. So uh, a different type is called a float, and this is when you have uh, something that mathematically resembles a rational number rather than an integer. So if we ask what the type of C is, it gives us a float. And ints and floats can interact, so we can do something like B times C is 10.5, and A times C should be 7. But notice that this is not an integer 7, this is a float. And so when you multiply an integer by a float, you get a float back. So there are other data types in Python as well. Another data type that we'll be working with a lot is a string. So we can define a string using either a single quote or a double quote. And there are operators that work on strings just like they work on integers. And so, for example, here we're assigning the variable s to be what happens when you add the string machine to the string learning. And what you get out afterwards is this string here. So when you use the uh, plus command, that gives you a concatenation. And so now that we've defined this variable, uh, there are other things that we can do with it. So Python gives us a lot of tools to interact with string. So we can uh, make this uppercase. We can make this lowercase. We can also ask how long the string is. And so we can do the length of s, and we get 16. Another data type that we'll be using a lot of in this class are lists. So a list is just a sequence of items. So we can define a list, for instance, of strings. And so you'll notice that we have data types separated by commas within a list. And we can ask how long this list is. It's four items long. We can also uh, create another list, for instance, and say that fruits plus other fruits now gives us back another list. And so just to double check this, Yes, it's still another list, and it worked like the concatenation in strings. Python allows us to access individual elements in this list by using um, the list index operator, and those are square brackets. So if we have the fruits list and we want the first element, we do fruits 0. And so notice that Python, like many computer programming language, counts from zero. We can also get more than one element in the list. So if we want uh, the middle elements of this list, we can do fruits from the second to the fourth element. And so it does not include the fourth element. So this gives us orange, which is in position number one and pair, which is in position number two. Another thing we can do is we can apply functions to our list, and now it has reordered uh, the list so that it's in sorted order based on uh, Python's internal sort function. And so there are many different types of operators that are associated with uh, list objects. You can find out which ones are available by using the help command. So you can just do 
uh, help fruit, and you can see what commands can you do on a list object. And so you can use spacebar to go through all of these commands to see what they do. Uh, and when you're done, you hit Q to get back to Python. So next up, we're going to talk about dictionaries. So the next thing that we're going to talk about are dictionaries. So dictionaries are built on an idea of a key value pair. And we have a bunch of keys, and every time we look up a key, we get the associated value. So let's say that we have a dictionary called students, and student stores a lookup from the name of a student to their score in the class. So notice that we're using curly brackets. So lists use square brackets, dictionaries use curly brackets. And the key Nash is associated with the value 92. So now we've created a dictionary called students, and we want to look up the value for Nash we get 92. We can add additional values to the dictionary directly. So if we want to add a new score for someone called uh, Turing, we now have a dictionary that looks like this. And if we want to change a score, we can do so in the same way. If we try to look up someone who isn't here, we will get an error. So oftentimes what you'll want to do is you'll first want to ask, is a key in a dictionary? So if you ask, is Knuth in this dictionary, it will tell you no. But if you ask, if Turing is in this dictionary, it will say true. And again, you can use the help command to find out other commands associated with the dictionary that you can use. And so there are functions that allow you to get just the keys and also to just get the values. So if we ask what are the keys, we get those. And if we ask what are the values, we get those. Dictionaries are very fast. Uh, the keys are hashed, and so you can look up a particular value in constant time. So next what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how you can write scripts that combine many of the commands that we've been using into a larger overall. So let's take a look at a script called for each.py. This should be in your demos directory. So here we have a list that we've called fruits that contains apples, oranges, pears, and bananas in that order. So remember that when you define a list, you use square brackets. And now what we're going to do is we're going to loop through the items in that list, and the variable ff contains one of the items in the list, and it goes through all of them in turn, and then it will print out that each fruit is for sale. So what's happening here is we have this string, and inside that string is a placeholder. That placeholder will be replaced by the contents of the variable ff, which as we've defined up here, are going to be the fruits in this list. So let's take a look at what happens when we run Python. So remember on the command line you type the name of the program that you want to run and then the name of the script is used as the argument to the Python command. So in this case it's the script for each.py. We hit enter and it goes through one by one and prints out for each of the fruits apples for sale, oranges for sale, pears for sale, bananas for sale, based on the order that we had in the original list. Okay, so now let's do something a little bit more complicated. 
condition.py and what we have here is we have a dictionary of prices for the fruits. So we have apples, oranges, and pears, each with its own price. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the dictionary and we'll then have a if statement that asks the question, is the price of the corresponding fruit less than two dollars? If it is, then print out that I'll buy it. Otherwise, print out that this fruit is too expensive. So, let's now run that program condition.py and here we'll say that you'll buy pears, you'll buy oranges, but the apples are too expensive. And so notice that we went through the items, we first did pears, and then we did apples, and then we did oranges. This happens because dictionaries, so remember we define dictionaries with curly brackets like we did up here, don't have an internal order, unlike lists. So lists had a pre-specified order, but dictionaries are an unordered object. Now is a good time to bring up how important indentation is in Python. And so notice that if we slightly change the program, so I'm going to edit the file condition.py, and so I will change it so that we didn't indent this print statement, like so. And now I, now I will exit out of the editor, and I will run the program, and I get an error. And so this is Python saying, I expected you to indent that, but you didn't. And when we go back here and correct the issue, it runs again. Unlike many other languages, Python uses the indentation in the source code for its interpretation. And I would set up your uh, editor so that uh, you use uh, a fixed number of spaces, whether you hit the spacebar or tab, uh, just to preserve your sanity down the line. So next what I want to talk about are functions. Functions that you call from Python and uh, functions that you write yourself. So first, let's use a very common function in Python called range. So let's create a list called nums with the numbers 1 to 6. So to do that, I used a function called range. So range, if you only give it one argument, produces all of the numbers less than that integer. So if we gave it range 7, we would get all of the integers less than 7. If you give it two arguments, then it uses the first argument as the start, and then it gives you all of the uh, integers less than the second argument, which is what we did to create nums. This is how you call a function in Python. You type the name of the function, then open parentheses, close parentheses, and arguments inside that function separated by commas. And if you want to know what a function does, type help and then the name of the function. Okay, so now we have created this list called nums. What if we wanted to create a new list that had the uh, numbers inside nums but added one to each of those numbers? So if we wanted to do that, we could write that in this very convenient shorthand called list comprehension, which is you iterate over each of the items in a list and then perform some operation on those numbers. Um, and so here, for each x in the list nums, what we're going to do is add 1. And that produces a 
new list like so. And these list comprehensions can be uh, more elaborate. So for example, you can add in conditions. So we can write an expression like this, which just returns uh, the elements originally in the set nums. Or we can add a condition to that if the number is evenly divisible by 2, in which case, so this is the modulo operator, so this divides the num this divides x by 2 and checks the remainder. And this only returns x if the remainder of x when divided by 2 was 0. That is, if it's an even number. And so then we get the even numbers. If we only wanted the odd numbers, we would change the statement so it looked something like this. If you're familiar with uh, lambda functions from scheme, you'll recognize that list comprehension is similar to the math function in languages like Lisp or Scheme. How do you write your own function? So here we use the function range, but what if we wanted to write a function that, for instance, uh, took a number, uh, multiplied it by 2, and added 1? So we can define a function like that. So, so we'll call this function mol2 add 1. And we'll say that it only takes one argument, and we'll call that argument x. And so now what we'll do, this defines the signature of the function. And then we will define the body of the function by saying we will return 2 times x plus 1. And so now we have this function called mol2 add 1. And when we give it the argument 5, we should get back 11. And we do. And we can now use this function inside our list comprehension. If we wanted to take our original list and for each element in the list multiply it by 2 and add 1, we could do so in a list comprehension that looks like this. And when we hit enter, we get the result. And we can use the original range function that I showed you earlier to make this a little quicker, where you don't have to define nums as a separate variable. Now we're going to dig into how Python handles object-oriented programming. So let's take a look at the file called shop in the demo directory. So here this defines a class called fruit shop. Associated with the class are a number of methods. Each method is a function, defined like we defined functions before. This function has the reserved name underscore underscore init underscore underscore. That means it's the constructor of this is the function that gets called when we create a new instance of the fruit shop class. It has three arguments. The first argument is automatic. Every method of a class has self as its first argument. This allows methods to access data in between and across function calls. So for example, the constructor takes an argument fruit prices and then saves it as a part of itself. Specifically, self.fruitPrices now contains the fruit prices information passed into the constructor. Other methods then can access this information. For example, the get cost per pound method can look at this information and tell you how much an entry in this dictionary is. So here it accesses self.fruit prices and then retrieves the information that was stored earlier. 
Okay, now let's take a look at this in action. So we're going to start up Python, but we need to get the information from the source code into Python, so we're going to use the import command. Now all of the information that was in the file called shop.py, so we leave off the dot py here and just say shop, all the information that was in that file is now inside Python. So I can now create a new fruit shop object. So why didn't it like that? I tried to call the constructor argument without any explicit arguments, but it needed three. It needs self, which is automatic, so we don't need to provide that. And then it needs the name of the fruit shop and then some prices. So let's do that. And so uh, if I didn't remember that, I could always go help.fs. Oops, uh, sorry, help.shop.fruitshop, the name of the class, and then get more information about the different functions that we can call. OK, so now. Let's create a fruit shop called um, Joe's. With the following fruit. And if we look at what FS is, we see that it's an instance of the class fruit shop, just like we wanted. And now we can ask for help on what we can do with this fruit shop. So for instance, we can get the cost per pound of a particular fruit. So if we ask for oranges, it's $3 per pound. But if we ask for kiwi, it says that the shop didn't have any kiwi because it wasn't defined in the initial data structure the dictionary that we passed in with all the prices. So that's a very brief introduction to classes. Please play around with them and we'll be seeing more of them very soon when we start using classes from other software packages. In particular, we're going to be using classes from Python's built-in libraries and from a library called the Natural Language Toolkit, which you have to download and install yourself. There's more information about that on the course webpage. If you have any questions about that, ask on Piazza. But let's assume that you have NLTK installed, and then you can go in and import NLTK and the Python regular expression library. So we're importing two things at once here, a little complicated, so it took a while. So now let's say that we have a piece of text like so. And now we're going to use a function in NLTK called regular expression show. So this has a help string so we can see what it does. It takes a regular expression and then shows us all of the instances of that regular expression in a string. So if, for example, we want to show the regular expression, um, either the word oats or the word eat in the string that we just defined. It gives us this, highlighting all of the regular expressions with curly brackets. Similarly, if we wanted to do this directly through Python, Python gives us a function called findAll that given a regular expression like like so, equivalent to the one that we had before, it then finds all of the examples of that as a list from our sentence. Now we're going to use classes from NLTK. So first we're going to get a class called WordPunked Tokenizer. And what this class does is it takes a big long string of text and breaks it up into individual words. In this case, it gives it to us as a list. 
the other class that we're going to use is called the Porter Stimmer. In this case, it gives it to us as a list. The other class that we're going to use is called the Porter Stimmer. The Porter Stimmer takes words that have suffixes and turns them into a common base form. We'll see examples of this in a moment. Both of these are classes, so we need to instantiate them. So we're going to create a tokenizer, and just for brevity, we'll just call it T. And we'll also create a stimmer, and we'll call it S. I encourage you to play around with these guys on your own, but let's just see a quick example. So if we tokenize our sentence, it takes the original sentence that we had and turns it into a list of strings. That is, separating each of the individual words into an element in this list. For example, it makes the choice to separate wouldn't into three separate elements in the list, wooden, the apostrophe, and t. But let's say that we wanted to normalize this a little bit more. We can use list comprehension to do that. So for example, what we can do is we can also stem each of those words. And so now this takes mares and turns it into mare. It also takes little and removes the e. It also turns ivy, ivy, into ivi. This is useful for when you have words that change their spelling when they're pluralized. This will turn, for example, flies, f-l-i-e-s, into f-l-i, and also fly, f-l-y, into f-l-i. Let's see that. This way, even though you have different forms of the same word, they'll all be turned into the same stem. We can also do more normalization. So for example, we could make everything lowercase. Or we could throw out words that are too short. And now we have a much more reasonable idea of what the words are in the string of text. And these are many of the functions that we'll be using throughout the course. We'll also be using many other functions from NLTK, but those will be introduced as we need them. While Python represents the technical foundation of the course, probability is the mathematical foundation of the course, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this lecture. So first, why are we even talking about probability? How to get probabilities we care about from data is one of the core principles of computational linguistics or data science in general. And later classes uh, will talk about how to do this for different probabilities models and different types of data. But first, we need key definitions of probability. So it's very important that you get this probability stuff down. And specifically for computational linguistics and the handling of natural language data, the only way that we have been able to make any progress in computational linguistics in the last 20 to 30 years is using statistical models of speech recognition, machine translation, part of speech tagging, or parsing. Everything before that, before the statistical revolution, uh, basically came to a grinding halt, and the only way that progress was made is through statistical methods. Okay, so first, what's a probability distribution? What's a probability? So probability is a language to talk about random variables, where random variable is any probabilistic outcome. So for example, the flip of a coin, the height of someone chosen randomly from a big group of people, those are probabilistic outcomes. 
Um, and in the class, it's, it's often useful to think about other quantities that are not really probabilistic as behaving like random variables. So for example, the temperature on a specific day, or the number of times one word appears in a document, or what word appears after a sequence of words. So random variables uh, take on values in some mathematical construct called a sample space. And the spaces can be either discrete or continuous. So if you can count the outcomes, that's discrete. So a coin flip, that's discrete. Height, you can't count that um, because you can have anything between zero and infinity, any fraction, uh, any real number. Uh, the number of words in a document, however, that again is a uh, discrete probability distribution. We'll represent uh, random variables with capital letters and the realization of a random variable with a lowercase letter. So for example, x is the coin flip and x is one value of a coin flip, either heads or tails. And this class will focus on discrete events because words are discrete. So what's a discrete probability distribution? So you have a sample space and everything in the sample space can be counted and a probability distribution assigns some number to each event saying how likely it is. So for example, if you have a coin, there are two outcomes, uh, either heads or tails. If it's an unfair coin, then you might have 0.7 for heads, 0.3 for tails. And one definitional property of a probability distribution is that these numbers must sum to one. One of these events must occur. And each of the probabilities have to be greater than or equal to zero. And finally, one additional definitional uh, component of probabilities is that the probabilities of disjunctions are sums over part of the space. So um, if you're talking about uh, the outcome of a die being uh, bigger than three, that's the sum of the components of that space. So the die could be four, five, or six. And those things must add to give you the probability of a die being greater than three. Okay, so uh, that's what probability distributions are, but how do you work with probability distributions? So one thing that we may want to do is in your event space, there may be two different types of outcome that we'll represent in the abstract by A and B, and we may want to think about the union of those events where A and B both happen, and the union of those events. And so if we want to reason about the union of two events, we add up the individual probabilities and then subtract out their intersection so we don't double count. Often, we'll want to consider collections of random variables and express what we know about their probabilities through what's called a joint distribution that tells us the probability of different combinations of outcomes. So for example, if we flip four coins, then we would represent the joint probability of that space uh, by assigning a probability to each of the uh, 16 values, 2 to the 4. And one way of visualizing this is uh, if we have a single uh, random variable, x, that partitions the uh, sample space in some way, and we overlay the distribution for y, and that gives us more outcomes. Sometimes we know that something will happen and we want to express the probability of something else happening. So let's represent those events by A and B. We know that B is happening and we want to know what's the probability of A given that we know that B is going to happen. So this is how we represent it. We represent the probability of A given B as A vertical bar B. And this is defined as taking the probability of the uh, intersection of A and B and the dividing that by the probability of B. Conceptually, it looks something like this. You have your original event space and you only consider the space where B happens. So this is this uh, rhombus here 
and this is equivalent to dividing by the probability of b. So here's an example. What's the probability that the sum of two die is six, given that the first die is greater than three? So let's think about it. Uh, let's call a the first die and b the second die. So we know that the first is greater than three, so that's highlighted in yellow. And what we want to do is we want to reason about when is a greater than three and the outcome six. So there are only two ways of that happening in the yellow space. So uh, the probability of both a being greater than three and the sum being six, there are only two out of 36 ways for that to happen. And then the probability of b greater than being three is just three six or one half because there are six outcomes, equal probability, three of those satisfy being greater than three. And so when you do the simple algebra, uh, you get the probability of a being greater than three, given that b plus a is equal to six, is one ninth. And you can also see that from the chart on the left. Uh, there are a total of uh, three times six outcomes at the bottom half, so that's 18, and two of those have the total being six. So two over 18 is equal to one ninth. Another thing that we may want to do is we may want to turn a joint distribution into a conditional distribution. And we can do that by applying the chain rule. So you take a joint distribution, you multiply it by one, express that as a probability of y over the probability of y, so anything over itself is one, and then that gives you the probability of x given y times the probability of y, substituting in the definition of conditional probability. And this generalizes to any uh, joint distribution. Another thing that we may want to do is we may start with a joint distribution and remove things that we don't care about. And we can do this through something called marginalization. So if we have the probability of x, y, and z as a joint distribution and we just want the probability of x, what we can do is we can sum over all of the possibilities of y and z to get a new distribution, only in terms of x. So first, uh, what we do is re we rewrite uh, the joint distribution using the chain rule from before, and then we can factor out the probability of x. Any discrete distribution, uh, when you sum over the possible outcomes, must give you one, so that gives us the probability of x. So here's an example of that. So let's say that we have a joint distribution over um, the temperature and the weather. If we want to marginalize out the weather, then for each column in the table, we sum up the two rows corresponding to the two weather outcomes, either sunny or cloudy, add those together, and we create a new table that gives us a new probability distribution about the temperature, not anything about the weather, which is what we wanted. Similarly, we can do the same thing for temperature. Uh, in this case, we have a new table, and for each of the rows, we sum over all of the temperature possibilities, and we get a new distribution that only tells us about the weather, not the temperature, what we wanted. Sometimes, we'll also get conditional distributions that are going the wrong way. So, maybe we get the probability of A given B, but what we really want is the probability of B given A. So we can flip those around using a identity called Bayes' rule. So you start with a conditional probability going the wrong way, and then you expand it out so that you're considering the entire event space. And you do that by undoing the first conditionalization. So the probability of A given B is the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of B. So you multiply it by probability of B to get back uh, the probability of the intersection. Okay, so now you want to restrict yourself to a different space. And so you restrict the outcome from the entire event space to just the cases where you know that A happened. And you do that 
by dividing by the probability of A. Again, just the definition of conditional probability. So this is Bayes' rule, and it allows you to flip conditional probabilities. Another important concept that we'll be using is the concept of independence. So we say that two random variables, x and y, are independent if and only if their joint distribution is a product distribution. That is, the joint distribution factorizes into distributions that only depend on each of the variables. If we know that two variables are independent, then their conditional probabilities are the same as their original probability. So knowing y tells you nothing about x. So mathematically, if you draw two socks from a multicolored uh, pile of laundry, is the color of the first sock independent from the color of the second sock? So think about that for a second. The answer is no, because you have changed the probabilities after drawing the first sock. Another example is if I flip a coin twice, is the first outcome independent from the second outcome? Think about that for a second. The answer is yes, because the coin hasn't changed, it's still a one-half probability, or if it was an unfair coin, it's still the same unfair probability. And so you can think about lots and lots of examples. So uh, whether you use a Mac and whether the green line is running on time, those are independent. The snowfall in the Himalayas, your favorite color being blue, those are independent. Not independent are you voting for Mitt Romney versus being a Republican. Um, not independent is whether the Redskins are playing versus uh, if there's a traffic jam on the Beltway. Uh, but the moral of the story is you should trust the math, not your intuition. And we'll have some examples of this in class. Probability is very important to the rest of this class. We'll be using it to reason about things like, what's the probability of the next word in a sentence? What's the probability of the meaning of a word? What's the probability of a word having a particular part of speech? What's the probability of a specific syntactic structure given a sentence? And really, the whole course is about probability, with the exception of the next class. So the next class gives you a little bit of a breather from probability, but after that we're going to be hitting probability really hard. So it's important that you get these probability concepts down cold, and we'll be working on it in class, but if you have any issues, please do come talk to me, ask questions on Piazza, whatever you need. Okay, so to recap, welcome to computational linguistics, welcome to using Python, welcome to using probability, we'll be using them. Uh, to do a lot of fun things for the rest of this semester. And so in class, uh, you guys will introduce yourselves to me. Uh, we'll have a very short quiz just to establish the pattern of starting every class with a quiz. The answer to that quiz is marzipan. That's the only question on the quiz. The quizzes will get harder after that. But the idea behind the quizzes is just to show that you've watched these videos. Uh, we'll deal with any installation issues that you have. We'll answer your questions on probability and using Python. I'll see you on Monday.